that we really appreciate everybody who did because this is a very crucial topic for our time uh, on Muslim-Christian relations. My name is Janet Adair Hansen, and I'm the moderator of PPAN, as the nickname is. Uh, and uh, uh, we were very honored to have as our special guests uh, this evening the Reverend Dr. Catherine Henderson from Auburn uh, Theological Seminary in New York City, and Imam Salahuddin Muhammad uh, from uh, nearby Newburgh, and also from the uh, Washington Office of uh, Public Witness, uh, Reverend Dr. J. Herbert Nelson. Uh, they will be our speakers. You'll have an opportunity to pose some questions, so be thinking about what you might like to ask. Uh, but we're going to start um, uh, with, with Catherine Henderson. I first wanted to remind those of you who are Presbyterians that on September 8th, uh, the stated clerk of our General Assembly, Grady Parsons, uh, and executive director of the General Assembly Mission Council, Linda Ballantyne, has sent out uh, um, a communication uh, to the churches and the presbyteries urging respect for our Muslim neighbors. Uh, and it's in the context of respect for each other uh, as brothers and sisters uh, together in what are Abrahamic faiths um, that we're very glad to have these people here this evening. And Dr. Henderson, if you'd like to begin. Thanks, Jenna. Um, I am really delighted to be here with all of you and uh, wanted to be here particularly because um, although I've been a Presbyterian minister ordained in 1982, I would say my uh, deepest sense of vocation is this, uh, this multi-faith world, this work of bridging religious divides. Um, and I have had the privilege of, of being at Auburn quite a long time now. Um, Auburn has been doing, Auburn is one of the oldest uh, Presbyterian seminaries in the country. It was founded in 1818 in upstate New York, moved to New York City in 1939. Um, and for almost 20 years now, way before 9-11, um, Auburn has, had, has been doing multi-faith work, trying to uh, bring people together across lines of religious difference uh, for, for respect, for dialogue, and for work together to heal and repair the world. So, um, so that brings us here to this current moment. Um, I think that for a lot of us, we feel that uh, this Park 51 situation that has, that, that has swept the country and the world by storm is actually um, an opportunity for us to have the conversation that we haven't had since 9-11. So, um, so we are, many of us, um, are really engaged in this, and I think it's timely that we're all here tonight, and it's one of the most important things that we can be doing. So um, Janet wanted us to talk a little bit about uh, the current state of Christian-Muslim relations, and uh, so I want to, to say a little bit, and she used the word Islamophobia, uh, fear of Islam, and so I want to set a little bit of a context, where an analysis of where I think things are, um, and then some of the challenges and opportunities. And, uh, and then I think all three of us are going to talk, and then we're going to come at, at, at a few other topics along the way. Um, I have a friend who, who says, and I sort of agree, that um, I'm not sure that uh, fear of Islam is, is what the fear is really all about. Um, I think. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of fear going around right now, but I'm not sure it's, it's really fear of Islam, because I think when you look underneath, um, it's uh, that, that Islam has become a, uh, and Muslims have become a convenient scapegoat. Um, I think there's the fear of the economy uh, that underlies a lot of what we've been seeing recently. We have, uh, in this country, come to know ourselves primarily as consumers. Um, and when that is no longer possible, um, as it has uh, not been true since the, uh, since the recession of la the last couple of years, I think we're in a place where we don't exactly know who we are um, as, as a country. Um, and so uh, we thought that one of our core values was that everybody could own a home, um, and that's clearly not played out in quite the way that we had wanted. And so I think there's a great internal malaise and 
Uh, and so some of this uh, scapegoating of Muslims is, uh, is at base a fear of the economy. Um, I think the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the dragging on of those wars um, uh, have really, um, and they are certainly of questionable value and purpose, I think, for everybody, including probably people who, um, who believe that we should go to war in the first place. But um, I think for, for many of us, our children are dying, and we don't really know for what. And so the, the dragging on of those wars also adds to this deep fear and malaise. In 2050, um, we will no longer be a majority white nation. Um, so I think there are underlying demographic shifts that are happening now that are really seismic. Uh, that I and I'm not sure that uh, that people can articulate it or even particularly aware of it in a conscious way. But uh, but at a point where we're all going to be minorities at some point in terms of these demographic shifts. I think all of this is kind of a, a kind of seed bed for, for fear and malaise. Um, and then we're in an election season. Um, and there, uh, with a polarized public and politicians who will stop at nothing, who seize upon the fodder that's available, stoking fire and normalizing hate speech. Um, and I think that you can't uh, be as open about uh, racial prejudice anymore. And so I think uh, I think that Muslims are the target of a lot of uh, a lot of this um, this fear, this malaise, and and hate, and certainly um, as we're seeing also violence. Um, so there's there's kind of a piling on um, that we've seen over the last period of time. So I think all of these things, as I look at it, provide kind of a context, a kind of perfect storm coming together um, with the Park 51 situation. And you had, um, a, 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 in August, you know, August is, is a low media time, low action time. Uh, and so um, the media is definitely going to pick up in a big way whatever's there, and, and we know what happened. Um, so, so I think, you know, for us as, as people, people of faith, um, the issue here underlying all of this that we have seen recently um, is really about human security. You know, how do we understand being safe? What makes us safe? And, um, and so, and, and of course, that, that's what we should be talking here about. Um, I think there's some real challenges uh, in Muslim-Christian relations. Um, although Muslims have been here for many years in this country, uh, mus the Muslim population has been growing in the U.S., uh, 8 to 10 million or so now Muslims um, in this country. And although Islam uh, and Muslim communities have been, been becoming more institutionalized in some ways in the past 50 years, um, Muslim communities are, are pretty decentralized. And in the way that uh, in the Christian world we have the National Council of Churches or, or the World Council of Churches or denominational bodies or retreat centers like Stony Point, um, agencies, um, there, there aren't e equivalent structures yet um, in, in the American Muslim world. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, you know, it, it, sometimes it's very difficult to figure out how you make those connections, you know, how you, to whom do you relate? Um, and I think that we, we see this um, in the media, the media, I know because we have something called Auburn Media, I know the media as we talk to journalists, you know, who do we talk to? Who is, who is the peer um, to, the, to this person in the Jewish Christian world? And then of course there's the question, you know, that began and, and we hear over, you know, where are the Muslim leaders, you know, why don't they speak out, you know, that's, that's what we hear, but I think that the expectation is, is that Muslim leaders are going to speak out in the way that we expect them to, and, um, and that may be an unfair expectation, so, but this kind of decentralization, um, I'm just thinking back, for example, to the General Assembly experience around the Middle East report. The, the Jewish communal world was very organized, and so there was an umbrella group that could 
quickly organize a lot of different organizations and come out with a statement. Um, we're able to do that in the Christian world, um, but that kind of structure and ability to do that is, is not where the Muslim community is in this country as I see it. And obviously you can disagree with me or, or add other things. Um, I think we in the Christian world uh, tend to look at, often at, at Islam as monolithic. Muslims as monolithic, all the same. Um, and certainly other religious traditions look at us that way as Christians too. But, uh, but Islam in the U.S. is very diverse. You have Muslims from the Middle East, from the Balkans, from Southeast Asia. Um, half of the Muslim population of this country are African Americans. Um, and there are, um, as, there, as is true for Christians and Jews and other religious groups, um, there, are, uh, there can be internal disagreements and, um, and, uh, and, and different ways of looking things. Um, there's some discussion among Muslims of who's a true Muslim, um, just as there are discussions in the Christian community of who's the, who's the true Christian, and in the Jewish community, who is really a Jew. So I think all of us, um, from the outside, we look at these other religious traditions sometimes as monolithic, but in fact, there is, there is subtlety, there is difference um, within these communities.